Please open your Bibles up to, uh, let's see, where is it? Acts chapter 13. Acts 13. Now, O our God, what shall we say after this? We have forsaken thy commandments. That's a good verse. I'll run with you. My first run in, in uh, my, what do they call it when you're, when you're over 40? Perfect. Well, thank you. Yeah, my first forty-year-old run. We'll see. Like maybe my first heart attack. And I have another forty-two, right? We'll have you to use. You let me know. You come on over. Let's do this. I need somebody to, you know, follow me at a stretcher or something next time I try to run. You will, Melissa. Follow me at the stretcher. You can't lift me. <laughs> Just you know, we could put like a hook or something on me, like a heavy belt with a hook on it. Yeah. Just follow me with a winch truck. Green, yeah. Don't lift me up. I'm going to die because they won't be able to roll me over to do CPR. <laughs> I better shape up, huh? It's getting real now. I need green. Acts chapter 13. 13. Good to see you tonight. Glad you're all smiling. Yeah, you know, we just don't have anything to be upset about, do we? Honestly. Uh, we have some things to pray about this week. Uh, probably one of the, the biggest betrayals in, in the Supreme Court justice appointments, uh, Anthony Kennedy has uh, retired. And man, I'll tell you what, it could make a difference if we get a, a decent Supreme Court justice in our country. You pray about that this week. And uh, the Bible says that the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. As the rivers of water, move with it with us so every will. The appointments that I know of that our president is looking at are Catholic. And uh, while that's an improvement over maybe atheist or whatever, do you realize that out of nine justices, we don't have a single evangelical Christian representing mm -hmm. us in our nation? It would be really fantastic if we were to have a born again. Mm -hmm. So you pray about that. You pray that uh, it's been amazing, actually, I, in many ways, uh, this president, this sitting president, has uh, defied his lifelong reputation. He's just done things that are inconsistent uh, with his wicked past in, in many instances. And so there's a real opportunity. And uh, you pray for this country. Uh, yeah, we need that. We need that this week. Won't won't uh, <laughs> won't change God's ultimate plan. Right. Um, but uh, God can be gracious to us. And so. Pray for that. Listen, I'll just tell you something. I'm a beggar, and I'll take I'll take anything I can get for free. You know, and uh, I, I really appreciate Charlie's Sunday School this morning on Jephthah and his vow. And one of the things that really kind of been in my mind all day is how that his innocent daughter. You know, we look at her life and we think, what a tragedy that the vow of her father affected her life in such a way. And yet, when we look at her, you know, she, her life had an eternal impact. You know, a lot of people. Their, life have, their lives have no eternal impact. I think, man, if I had to die because of something someone did or whatever, but if God used it, if God could just use my life, that would be a good thing, wouldn't it? And uh, so that's fine. Uh, I prefer the painless road, if possible. But, uh, you know, the martyr's crown is one that would be all right to have, too. I'm not asking for it, but uh, I, can, I can take it. You know, God's really good, isn't he? He's looking anyway, and our God is good. Well, you in Acts chapter 13. I want to read... If you uh, will permit, uh, I want to read, I guess, um, I guess we'll, we'll start in um, 28. So speaking of Jesus, his death on the cross, though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they, Pilate, that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God, but God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. But God raised him from the dead. I tried. But God raised him from the dead. You can amen a lot of things. I don't care if you do or not. I, but uh, I'll tell you, people amen just about anything. Yeah, but this, that's, that's quite a line right there. But God raised him from the dead. It just turned on its head every evil intent, every evil purpose, and fulfilled the gospel plan. God, but God raised him from the dead. 
And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you glad tidings, how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And as concerning that he raised him up from the dead, now no more to return to corruption, he said on this wise, I will give you the sure mercies of David. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw corruption. But he, whom God raised again, saw no corruption. Father, help us this evening as we look at the resurrection, not only to have our hearts thrilled by it, but Lord, to have cemented in our minds that this has always been your purpose. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen. I just have a simple message this evening. It's really, really simple, and it's probably intended more uh, to be a help to you just because you're going to hear this in the next couple of years. There are theological trends that reoccur every 10, 20, 30 years. And I'm 40, and so uh, I've seen them. Uh, almost all of them, I've seen them occur either on 10-year basis or a 20-year basis, on a 20-year basis, but I've actually seen it a few times. Just like there are economic trends, do you know what worries me about our economy right now? <laughs> Does anything worry you about our economy right now? Now, some of y'all aren't part of the good part of it. Matter of fact, probably for most of us, not much has really changed. But worry, what worries me about a good economy is, is the bad economy. Because if it's good, that means a bad one's coming. That's a, that's a trend. The real estate trend right now is, is high. It's too high uh, to be affordable. People can't afford housing on the basis of our local living wage. And so like in my neighborhood, I couldn't afford to live in my neighborhood right now. And uh, you know, a few years ago, I was able to afford to live in my neighborhood. But if I were to move there now, I couldn't buy a house in my neighborhood. You know what it tells me? <laughs> it tells me that, they're, that things are gonna crash. I don't, I don't wanna buy a property right now at uh, the current real estate values because they are too high. And that's just a trend. Do you all remember 2004, 5, and 6? Well, this is what we call the bubble now when that was happening. And I told people, so this isn't real. Uh, banks lending money on uh, zero down payment loans on 0% interest, and then those buyers getting away with irresponsible buying by being able to flip a house and sell it to a more irresponsible person who then could sell it to a more irresponsible person. Everybody could take you know, a little bit out until the last guy that got stuck. And then we had the collapse and the crash. Uh, that happened as a result. That's good. That's it's it's not spiking as hard this time around, but it's coming up again, and it's been you know about ten years since the last time it crashed. That's about a ten year, just a ten year trend. It's just like this. If you put it on a graph, it goes up, it goes back down, it goes up. Sometimes it comes to to a higher all time uh, point, but it just goes up and down. That's a trend. There are economic trends. If you are uh, if you're if you're smart, you can just check things, and you can you can uh, fill out trends, and you can figure out a way to, you know, uh, watch the trends and predict them. And you know, more times, more often than not, if you know history, you know the future. You can figure out what's going to happen by looking at what happened, and the same things happen again. And uh, there are uh, political trends. There are political trends, and history does repeat itself. If uh, you're not educated, if you don't know what happened in the past. You'll repeat the same mistakes that people made before you. And so the same is true with theological trends, actually, as well, I have found. Uh, Calvinism rears its ugly head about every 10 years. I mean, just for, he goes away, gets beat out, and, uh, you know, everybody gets in the Bible and they see the problem with following a systematic theology that is systematized by and named after a man, and people identify it, and it gets thumped pretty good and uh, it goes away, and uh, the Calvinists <laughs> shave their beards and go into hiding. And, <laughs> and then, uh, 10 years later, some new guy that's, you know, he's new on the scene, reads an old book, and says, wow, that's brilliant. I never found that in the Bible. That's amazing. <laughs> and uh, he starts off again, and some guy, you know, really uh, is a great proponent, writes some new books that say the same things. And it just all comes back again. 
there are theological trends. And the same is true uh, with uh, uh, prophecy. The same is true with um, just theology. And uh, every about 20 years, people get into, um, they get confused, I guess. Not confused, not the same people, but there's always a new generation that always... <laughs> listens to the same false doctrine and for a while it seemed to be caught up in a wave. And so there are, there are two theological trends that are happening right now uh, that are um, dangerous doctrinally. They're, they're dangerous, distracting Bible doctrines. And uh, I'm not going to deal with both of them this evening, but one of them is used to be called uh, ultra-dispensationalism. Uh, it... Uh, is called by people that don't understand dispensations just simply dispensationalism, but it isn't the same. Now, you know what a dispensation is, don't you? You know what a dispensation is? A dispensation is, well, you know what a dispensary is? Y'all know what a bubble gum machine is? Yes. That's a dispenser. Okay, you put a, you put the, do they still have bubble gum machines? Mm -hmm. Okay, you put a pen in. And you slide the little thing. <laughs> you put a penny in, and you slide the little thing, and like a hundred chiclets come out. <laughs> oh, good old days. <laughs> yes. Or you take the dime machine, you grind a penny down on the pavement, and you slip it in, and turn. No, you don't do that. That's not <laughs> <Come> right. On. <laughs> That's not honest. Uh, you know, you you uh, turn the turn the little knob, and bubble gum comes out. That's a dispenser. Okay, a dispensation is a dispensing of something. Do you understand the word? Okay, uh, here's, here's a use, uh, or here's an example of use in the Bible. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners, has spoken unto us in, these, in the last days, or has spoken unto us in the last days by our fathers, hath in these last days spoken unto us by His Son. God gave us the fathers or our prophets to speak to us, and now He spoke to us by Jesus. It's a dispensation. Okay? Uh, here's another one. Proverbs, is it, I think it's chapter 20 I, or 22, I'm not sure, but it talks about the Word of God and it being a perfect book, and it says, Add thou not unto His words, lest He reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Uh, Revelation, the last chapter of Revelation, last couple of verses, talk about or speak of uh, Christ. And they speak in, let me, let me just read it to you really quickly. Um, speak in verse, well, let's see, chapter 22 and verse 18. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. Mm -hmm. Revelation 22 seems to indicate that there is a danger in adding to or taking away from the word of God. Uh, we have not always had we have not always had the entire canon of the scripture, have we? Uh, before Christ came, there was about 400 years of silence. And it was a time period in which people had understood that God was done speaking with His nation Israel. And the last thing we learned in Malachi was that God had divorced or put away Israel. And that He had a future plan for her, but she was put away. And God didn't talk to Israel. That's why for uh, Judaism today it's so important that they embrace their rabbinical writings. And that's why Hanukkah is so important to the Jews today. Because it is an example in intertestamental, that is between the Old Testament and the New Testament of the Scripture. It's an important miracle quote that they believe that they received that the oil didn't run out in the Hanukkah lamp. And so the reason that's important to them is they want to believe that God wasn't silent to them in that period. That is, God had removed His endorsement or His stamp on national Israel at that time. And so the, I, for one, am not a fan of Hanukkah. I know some believers uh, who don't really understand really the desire to say God was moving and God was working in this time period with our nation, but God wasn't. 
uh, working and moving in Israel in that time period. God's going to move and work in Israel someday. There will be, uh, of the 12 tribes, 12,000 of each of the tribes who will have turned to God. And that's a future event. It has not happened yet. And uh, that God has a future plan for Israel, but it's, it's not this dispensation today. We're in the church age. You study Daniel chapter 9, and you'll see that there is a period between that final week, that 70th week of Daniel, and that a week being a measure of seven, and that is uh, seven years. And so there's Daniel 9 predicted to the day when Christ would be born. And then we see in Daniel 9 and verse 26 that the Messiah would be cut off. And that would be a time period uh, where until Christ again works with Israel, there's a week left in Israel, but until that time period, God's working through the church today after the time that the Messiah was cut off, but not for himself, but for the sins of the nation. Okay, one theological trend I want to address this evening is the ultra-dispensational notion that salvation was different at different times. I'm a dispensationalist. Matter of fact, in the, last, in the last couple of weeks, I've had a number of people call and say, Pastor, are you a dispensationalist? And I say, yes, I am, but uh, I'm not going to name the names of the silly boys on YouTube that are arguing about it nowadays, but I don't believe what they believe. In other words, they're following an ism, a name of another guy that I'm not going to name, and they're just following him, and they're teaching what he taught, and that's that people were saved at different times uh, in the past than they're saved today in the church age, and that's a lie. And you can be a dispensationalist and not believe that. Other folks that are, that are anti-Semitic uh, deny that there are dispensations. And so each time period that God has worked with man, they just morph into an involvement of the next. And so today Israel, the promises for Israel would be to the church. And uh, so we would be spiritual Israel, and really Israel would be spiritualized always in whatever it was before Israel. Okay, so now I'm not going to teach dispensations this evening, but I want to look at and answer the question that I was asked by, I almost said idiot. That's not nice, but I was asked by somebody devoid of understanding to give me an instance where somebody in the Old Testament understood the notion that salvation was, uh, that, that the gospel was the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus. In other words, the idea is these people in the Old Testament times could not have known with clarity that Jesus would die, be buried, and resurrected from the grave. Now, we could write thick books about that, we could write thin books about that because there is, one of the things I say a lot of times is, is that the less the Bible says, the more you have to say in order to explain something that isn't in the Scripture. And so the thicker a book, <laughs> oftentimes what that means is that you're just blowing smoke and it takes a lot of words to you know, describe a circle long enough that people wear out before you get all the way around it and you tire them out with words. And that's what a lot of it is. Just long arguments. I've been asked by Brother Tony to respond to, oh, I don't know, about 10 or 15 videos on YouTube. And I've said, no, I'm not going to. Won't do it. Won't respond to uh, what some people say. And he's asked, why not? Well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, I don't have two hours to watch a guy ramble on and on who doesn't know anything about anything and throw so many random reasons out there that it's like you try to respond to this one, by the time you respond to it, he's off on this tangent. It's like talking to a Jehovah's Witness. You know, it's like, shoo, shoo. As soon as you start to answer, he says, what about this? And before you get done, he says, well, what about this? And you can't answer a single thing because it just just spatter like a shotgun a dozen <laughs> different things at you, and you just can't, just can't answer it. Uh, I, could it be done? Yes, it could. But it would be like a 20-hour video to answer a two-hour video. You know, and that's that's nonsense. I'm not going to do it. There's no there's no point. There's no purpose in that because they're not individuals looking for truth. The individuals looking for truth will have the Word of God and the help of the Holy Spirit, and they may get sucked into something, but they'll also get right back out of it as well. You may get following some. By the way, just get off YouTube. It's a waste of time. Get in a local church and test and prove. Test and prove. The, the ministry of the people that uh, you're involved with the ministry of. If there's a bad spirit about it, you'll know. 
you go, you'll see there's a bad spirit about it. The Holy Spirit of God will tell you that's, you know, we've tried the spirits and there's no way in the world that person's theologically sound because the Bible says about false teachers, by their fruits you shall know them. And you'll see it in the fruits of a false teacher that his doctrine is false. And then the Holy Spirit will help you with facts and so forth. But the question <laughs> that's answered is, is the gospel the death, burial, and resurrection? And if so, show me where in the Old Testament the gospel was the death, burial, and resurrection. Well, the Apostle Paul here in Rome, or Acts chapter 13 quotes four different psalms that describe the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Paul says, but God hath raised him from the dead, then Paul goes on to describe where in the Psalms David had referenced the resurrection. And one that's extremely clear is Psalm 16. Will you turn there real quickly? I'm not going to deal with all of them. Matter of fact, Google's your friend. You can you could go uh, and look at any of the references referring to individual Psalms in Acts 13, and you could just simply Google uh, that chat verse and, and put where is where is it referenced in the Old Testament? You could find it. And so, uh, if you don't have Google, ask Charlie. And Charlie will Google for you. Or make up an answer, or give you the actual answer, whichever you prefer. Uh, Psalm chapter 16. And uh, let's look at uh, uh, verse 7. David said, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the, in the night seasons. Now, we know what reins are when they're referenced in the Scripture. They're always referred, normally referred to as you know, that which pulls our heart, or directs our heart. Try, me, try my heart uh, uh, and, and try the reins thereof. See if, there's a, see if there's a wicked way in me, that sort of idea or notion. Like the Lord knows the hearts. He tries the reins of it. Reins are what controls the direction. It's not rain like pitter-patter on the roof, but rains like on a horse. Okay? So in verse 8, David said, I have set the Lord always before me because He is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, in verse 9, my heart is glad and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. And then verse 10 is where we're getting to, which is a quote of, which is quoted in Acts chapter 2 and Acts 13. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine Holy One to see corruption. Now notice in your Bible and mine, that Holy One is in all caps. And again, notice that Jehovah is invoked in verse 7 and verse 8. When you see capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in your Scripture, the translators that the Holy Spirit used to give us our copy of the Scripture accurately represented, instead of it being Adonai, which is a word for God, Jehovah, and it's, it is, means Yahweh, or the, the uh, word in the Hebrew with the triconsonantal root, that is not pronounced because of reverence or respect for God's name. You see, when God gave His word, and in, uh, really in the past, God's name was not blasphemed commonly. I, I'm not saying there were not blasphemers, there always have been. Individuals who are bold and daring to blaspheme the name of God, but people who loved God and who uh, the Holy Spirit used to transcribe the Word of God were very, very careful with even the saying of God's name. And so Jehovah would have been something that would have been very, very carefully written. I'm sure you've heard the stories about the scribes and so forth as they, as they wrote. Uh, before they would write, they would change their pen, change their clothes, take a bath, and then write You know the triconsonal root of Yahweh or Jehovah, Jehovah. And if you ever meet a Jehovah's Witness, they think it's a surprise. Nobody knows that God's name is Jehovah. Did you know God has a name? Yes, and people were very careful saying it. And it wasn't because we have a bad translation of the Scripture. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, because the translators were very, very careful with that word. Lord is the word, and it's Jehovah here. And so that's the root behind it. Now in verse, uh, verse um, 10, we see David saying something, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one, to see corruption. Will you please go back to Acts chapter 13? You can hold your finger there if you want to flip back and forth for reference. Look at verse 35. And as Paul is preaching the gospel to these Gentiles uh, and Jews and, and presenting the argument that this Christ is the one which was prophesied in the Old Testament to have been resurrected from the dead, which implies death and burial. Doesn't it? 
In other words, if a person says to me, Pastor, can you tell me the, where the Bible mentions in the Old Testament the death, the burial, and the resurrection? We'll stop just right there, just a second. What does resurrection imply? Death and burial, right? To be resurrected, you have to be laid down. Laid down, right? To be brought back from the dead, you, uh, to be resurrected, you have to be brought back from the dead. So, <laughs> pardon me if I have a hard time keeping a straight face when I tell you that resurrection implies death and consequently burial. In other words, really it's kind of silly, isn't it? To say those three words need to be together in the Bible. You need to see death, burial, and resurrection or in that dispensation... The, those poor folks just didn't know that Jesus would die and be buried and risen from the dead. That wasn't the gospel. They just believed in a Messiah of some sort coming and saving the nation. They didn't know that He would die for the sins of a nation. Pardon me if I don't think you're being honest or if I don't think you're being careful or if I just think that you have a theological persuasion you're trying to come from and you've created a straw man argument that you can knock down. You're not being honest if you don't think that resurrection implies death. Can you tell me one way that resurrection could not imply death? Could anyone here? Help me. Is there any way in the world that resurrection doesn't imply death? I'm coming back from the alive! <laughs> Does that make sense to you? I'm just telling you, I hate to say it, but that's how logical that's how logical theological arguments are, and yet many people are swept away by them. Many people follow them. Uh, really, honestly, folks, listen to me. This will help you a lot. The Bible says that in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know what private interpretation is? personal interpretation. In other words, I found something in the Bible that no one else ever found. And if you were on my level, you'd have either found it or understood it, but you're just not there. I remember I considered interning for a man in the summertime and I had some problems with what I perceived that he believed about the Word of God. So I asked him a question that was very insightful for me. I asked him because he was big time. And by the way, I love the languages. I, I'm not here tonight to tell you that you can't be helped by studying the languages. You're a fool if you think that a translation is uh, abolishes the text that it came from. You're lacking understanding. You're ignoring other nations, other languages for one thing, and you think that for some reason God's an American and that He gave us a translation, but he hates the rest of the world. He won't give them one. You're a fool. I'm just telling you, you're foolish if you if you take that perception. Do I believe in preservation, and do I believe we have a preserved Word of God in our language? Yes, I do. I absolutely do. But if you think that you can't learn anything, you think that a daughter language is better than a parent language, my friend, the logic that is behind that is it, too bad. It's too bad. You're not thinking. You've checked out your mind. And uh, so the translation comes from a language, and the language is important. And many individuals um, will just ignore the language behind a translation. Say, well, you know, we don't have to know. Listen, you don't have to know Greek to understand the Bible. You can know your Bible as well as I can. I've had probably, I don't know, I've had years of Greek. I've had a couple years of Hebrew. And you can understand your Bible without knowing Greek and Hebrew just as well as I can. Now, if you don't learn grammar, don't come and try to tell me grammar arguments, okay? Don't try that nonsense with me because if you don't know grammar, you don't understand your Bible well. The more you understand your language, the English language, the better you'll understand your Bible. If you want to be an uneducated Christian and just guess at things and then say, well, the Holy Spirit told me, that's private interpretation. But the Bible says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, God gave His Word on purpose. He meant what He said, and He intended it to be understood. You ever play games with understanding? 
Well, officer, I know that's what the sign meant, but the thing is, what I thought was because up there, there's another sign that says something different. I thought that I could average what this sign said and what that sign said, and you know, if I just accelerated on an average curve, well then I would be, you know, if it's 25 here, I had this happen one time. <laughs> Melissa and I were driving in a speed trap town at nighttime, and the town was Jackson, Jackson, Tennessee, right, Melissa? And a police officer, I just, phew, lights came on behind me. I stopped, I was driving my Volkswagen Rabbit. And the police officer said, he laughed, and he said, he said, you know how fast you're going? I, said, I told him how fast I was going. And he said, back there the sign says 65. Right there it says 55. There it's 45, 35, 25. I mean, literally, like, 65, 55, 45, 35, 25. <laughs> I mean, you just couldn't hit the brakes fast enough if you weren't from there. I mean, he was just like, shoo! It just went, you know, he's like, there, it's there. It was, it's what he said, isn't it, Melissa? And, and it ain't going down a hill. You're going down a hill while it's decelerating. <laughs> so, I'm not kidding you. Uh, I, anyway, it was a fun traffic stop. He didn't give me a ticket. But he said, go over on the interstate drive. <laughs> he said, don't drive around here. It's a good warning. I, I listened to it. Okay, now the fact of the matter is the sign said what it said in between, right? And so if I'm, if I go, if I'm averaging, you know, between 25 and 65, and, and right here, I'm going 55, I'm over the speed limit. And we play silly games sometimes with we thought kind of things, don't we? And people do that theologically as well. Well, here's how I take that. I heard somebody say that? Here's what this means to me. Well, I know it says that, but I've heard a lot of those things. And friend, let me just tell you something. <laughs> if you're a kid and your parents tell you something, you know your parents pretty well, and you know what they mean when they say it, don't you? This whole selective hearing thing, it's not valid, actually. I know, I know there's selective hearing. I'm not saying that there isn't selective hearing. But what I'm saying is it's not a valid argument. Well, I thought you meant, no, you know exactly what I meant, right? When your parents tell you something, kids, you know what they mean, don't you? Yeah. You know what they mean. Now, you may catch it, well, technically what you said was... No, they said exactly what they meant, and you know it. And the Bible's the same way. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures is of any private interpretation. But holy men of God spake as they are moved by the Holy Ghost. In other words, God said what He meant, and anybody that's honest about it can know. That's helpful, isn't it? So I asked this pastor, I said, do you think that a person who doesn't know Hebrew and Greek can come to an understanding of truth in the same way that you or I can? And he said, no. And I said, I'm sorry, I can't agree with you there. Don't agree with that. Can a person be helped with their understanding? Sure. But you know, a person who doesn't know Hebrew and Greek can study some things. And they can learn things they don't know. And they can be open-minded and honest about things, and they can arrive at truth with the help of God's Spirit. And be confident about it. You know something? Listen to me. Something that used to bother me was intelligent people who were wrong about things. And I, and I knew they were intelligent. Matter of fact, more intelligent than I was. And I'd think, how can a person be that intelligent and take that position when it seems like the Bible's clear about this? And so then I'd question whether or not I was right because of my education or just a comparison of intelligence. You know, you can be very, very... Uh, inferior in intelligence and very, very correct in your theology if you have the right kind of a heart. The help of the Holy Spirit of God. That's, that's what 2 Peter 1, 21 means. That's one of the things it's teaching us. There's no private interpretation. You know what else it means? Anyone who is open-minded and honest will arrive at the same conclusion. Any person who's open-minded and honest will arrive at the same conclusion. It won't be something that you only understand or this person only understands, but nobody else does but you. Okay. Now, Paul, in both Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 2, do you see how hard it was for me to climb that? I just about fell down. A 40 thing, man, I'm telling you, it gets you good. Okay, I just about lost my balance, seriously, right there. So, uh, <laughs> Acts chapter 13, and... Uh, And verse, let's let, read verse uh, 35. Wherefore he saith also in another psalm, this is Psalm 16, Thou shalt not suffer thine holy one to see corruption. For David, verse 36, 
after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep and was laid unto his fathers and saw, what's the next word? Corruption. Okay, so the question that Paul is asking these individuals who know Psalm 16, he's saying if David were talking about himself and David's body saw corruption, could David be talking about himself if his body rotted in the ground? Or is there's record that David's body went to the ground and saw corruption? One day uh, I was preaching on the resurrection. A guy asked me, why three days? Well, it's because of corruption. Because uh, Christ could not stay in the ground and uh, His body see corruption or He wouldn't have fulfilled the prophecy of the Scripture. So that's why three days. Uh, Lazarus. How many days was Lazarus in the tomb? Four days. His body saw corruption. No, the, body literally, or the Bible literally means what it says and says what it means here. And so Paul is making an argument with the Scripture that his audience was familiar with. And he was asking the question, if there's no prophecy of the resurrection in the Old Testament, what was David talking about? And there are many of those instances. Uh, where's the death of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? Well, does anybody know Isaiah 53? Who hath believed our report? To whom is the eye of the, uh, the Lord revealed? And talks about how that Jesus Christ will grow up as a tender root, as a tender branch, and that ultimately He will be wounded for our iniquity, or for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace is upon Him. With His stripes we are healed. Does it reference the, the cruel death, and, uh, the death of Jesus Christ? Yes, it does. Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, when the Bible uh, mentions the Messiah being cut off, but not for himself, but for the sins of the people. Well, what is that talking about? The Messiah getting cut off, that, that seems like death to me, doesn't it, to you? Yes, it is. And uh, Acts chapter 2, this is such a valid argument uh, that the apostles actually use it a number of times in order to prove that Jesus Christ indeed was the Messiah. Acts chapter 2 and verse 25, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh did re shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to seek corruption. And so the Scripture quotes the Scripture many times. Many individuals will say, well, you know, the Psalms and the Proverbs, you know, the Psalms are poetic, uh, literature and they're good and the Proverbs they're you know they're Proverbs they're wise sayings but they're not inspired on the same level as the rest of listen my friend don't play that silly game right. throw your Bible away and walk out of the church house if you're gonna play that game if you're if you're an agnostic or an unbeliever just go ahead and be honest about what you are either the Bible is a supernatural book and it's inspired Word of God and all of it is or none of it is uh, if, it, if it has lies in it, don't, don't put the burden of finding out what the lies are on me. It's either all true or it's all untrue. It's all true. Isn't it? Okay, so David in Psalms then is teaching in, in Psalm 16. What is he teaching? Well, he's very, very clearly teaching the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thou will not leave my soul in hell, neither shalt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. And so I just wanted to answer the question for you tonight. When you bump into it, the trend's here. It's, uh, it's on an upswing. And when you bump into it in the next uh, six months or so, uh, I just want you to have thought about it already. And you know something? You don't need a long, grand discourse of all the verses in the Bible that prove the death, the burial, and the resurrection from the Old Testament. Let me give you two things that we saw tonight. First of all, resurrection implies death. Yes? Yes. Some of y'all just don't believe that. <laughs> resurrection implies death. And the resurrection of Christ and the death of Christ are implied over and again in the Old Testament. And they don't have to be coupled like they are in 1 Corinthians 15 when Paul says, I delivered unto you that which also I received the Lord Jesus, how that Christ died on the third day and was buried and rose again according to the Scripture. And that's the Gospel that Paul was presenting to the church at Corinth. He said that's the Gospel. And friend, I just want to say to you that the Gospel is has been and always will be the death, the burial, and the resurrection 
of Jesus Christ. That just seems like such a stupid theology. I have no idea what's what, what's even the point of that theology verse. I don't know. Like I'm not going to answer your question because it has too long of an answer. <laughs> really? Oh, okay. uh, but it's it's a reactionary theology. It's it's a response to another false doctrine, where a guy's clear over here, and so a guy sees that he's wrong and he responds by going clear over here. And most false theology is reactive. It's knee jerk. It's like when you test the reflexes and you hit a hit the well, it's the funny bone, right, Doc? Is that what they call it? Funny bone? You hit the funny bone and the knee kicks involuntary reaction. Well, there's theological reactions that are the same. And you got this nut job over here and this nut job over here, so that ain't right. And he, they just go like this, back and forth, and they're always, always, always chasing something um, flashy, shiny, and new. Uh, because I guess, you know, now I'm making a judgmental statement. Uh, go ahead and make it. I guess that, you know, based on what Hebrews 5 says about individuals that have to be fed with milk instead of meat, they're always going after the things that are already established. Hebrews 6, 1, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on leaving. What is it? Repentance, baptism, uh, baptisms, and I mean, things that are clearly taught in the Scripture that individuals who have been saved for years and years and years are still writing books about, reading books about, and arguing, bickering, and debating about. And my friend, the gospel is pretty clear. The gospel is pretty clear. If you don't know what the gospel is, ask Jesus. Jesus tells us specifically in John chapter 3. Whosoever shall call the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's pretty much that's, that's Romans 10. But Jesus says in, in John chapter 3, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And that's the cross. You say, well, Pastor, what? there's no resurrection there. Oh, there is. My friend, Jesus would not be the Messiah if he were not resurrected as prophesied in the Scripture. Theologians, they're not theologians, but I, I'm trying not to say idiot. It's not nice, but in, people that lack, well, how did I say it earlier? I said it nicely. Right? They lack understanding. Doom they lack understanding. What, doom coughs? Oh, thank doom you, Mrs. Dawes. Doom coughs. Yeah, doom coughs. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Dawes. That would be so classy to say. Actually, doom coughs kind of sounds meaner than dumb. It's got, it's got, that, it's got the kick sound to it, you know? Devoid of understanding. Yeah, devoid, is that what I said? Devoid of understanding. Individuals devoid of understanding. I want to debate and argue about this nonsense. Friend, get in your Bible. I mean, get in your Bible. Amen. Seriously, get in your Bible. Get in it. Know it yourself. And when you hear something, the other day, this pastor friend of mine posted, can anybody show me? And I thought of about a dozen verses that I could show him, but I thought, you know what? No, nobody can show you. <laughs> Actually. And I didn't say that either. I just deleted him and blocked him on Facebook. <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> You're a millennial. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, we'll pray. <laughs> Father, thank you tonight. Thank you so much for for the scripture and for the clarity of it. I pray that you would help us to be able to have wisdom, not to get caught up in theological trends, but to preach the clear gospel of Jesus in a way that people could know it and understand it. We ask in his name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>